Namaskar. In the past few lectures, we have looked at various cognitive and physical limits and capabilities of humans and how these limits and capabilities help the human factor engineers to design various modifications in uh, products and services and also design better interfaces. We have looked at attention, we have looked at memory and we have also looked at decision making. Today's class will focus on another important aspect which helps human factors engineers to study capabilities of humans and the limitations and design interfaces so that the humans and the systems can interact in a better way and this interaction could lead to increase in performances. The topic of today's lecture will be on motion and movements. We will also look at how movements and design of controls help in assessing the modifications that is needed in any uh, design interface or product. Let us start by taking an example. So, I have Manohar who works in the ship dockyard and he is a crane operator. His job is to operate the crane, carry heavy loads from ships which have docked in the shipyard and move these heavy loads from fixed position A to fixed position B. In his job, he has two or three control levers which he manipulates and a couple of foot pedals which help him in moving the crane in uh, opposite directions. So, with the help of the lever, Manohar can lower uh, the crane, get heavy loads attached to it and with the movement of another uh, lever, he can move this crane with the heavy load from the ship to a position on the dockyard. It is an easy job, but if you talk to Manohar, he will explain how difficult it can sometime become. Let us add a little bit twist to this story. One day Manohar appeared for his job. It is a routine day where he sits on a higher platform inside the crane, operates a lever and a foot pedal which moves the crane handle to a certain height along with a round movement of the crane. This round movement positions the crane near the deck of the ship. With the strike of another lever, the crane comes down and heavy load is attached to Manohar's crane. He gently lifts this heavy load because from his experience, he understands that the quicker action he does, the more swing the load will acquire and because of that he can run into mishaps. So, he slowly pulls the lever back and the crane rises with this extra load. He presses the foot pedal and the crane turns around to the shipyard where he has to dump his load. Manohar quickly positions himself at the appropriate position so that he can lower the load on the uh, deck, empty the uh, load and then move back to the earlier position for carrying more loads. As he lowers the lever which in turn will lower the load, he quickly realizes 
that some engineers on the ground are very close to where the load would be lowered. He freezes for a moment and does not understand what to do. His hand has already started movement and the lever is a little bit depressed down. The crane has also started making motion. Manohar realizes that if at this position he stops the crane or the lever, some inevident action would happen and this would lead into a mishap. He can see the emergency button on the crane console which if pressed will lead to quickly shutting off the crane motor and the crane being static at the position that uh, it is. The question is can Manohar quickly press this button and make the crane stop and save the people who are below on the deck. Can he quickly identify this emergency button and stop the crane? Because if he does not do that, the crane would come down, it will lower the load and there could be a chance of a mishap where people can get crushed under this heavy load. The situation that I have narrated is a situation which is similar to many work environments. People have to take quick actions and in this situation it is not only the cognitive capabilities and limitations of humans but another interesting fact which adds on to how quickly and how efficiently decisions are made. This additional factor that I am talking about is called the reaction or the movement. A study of how quickly humans can execute a motion or a movement would give human factor engineers enough data and evidences to design interfaces and modifications on equipments so that necessary em emergency actions can be taken very quickly. The present chapter will deal with these two parts. In the first part, we will look at what is movement and how is human movement governed? What are the theories related to the speed of a movement and the accuracy of the movement and how movement is measured? We will also try to understand various uh, theories which are closed loop and open loop theories which describe human movement. Towards the end, we will also look at what are controls and how the design of control should be. What is the layout and what is the display of a control which is best in terms of getting faster responses during emergencies. We will look at how controls are coded and we will also look at some of the basic theories based on which control should be designed. So, let us first start understanding what are motor skills or uh, movement related skills. Human operators have a limited capacity to move quickly and sometimes when we do move quickly, we can be prone to error. Just like the story that I was uh, narrating where Manohar had to quickly move to press this emergency button so that the a crane stands stills and an accident can be prevented. If he presses the button too quickly, there are chances that he will not be accurate in putting enough pressure on the control to stop the crane. Think about emergency buttons. You might have seen these emergency buttons on trains, on planes, on several other products. These emergency buttons are big in size and they require some amount of extra effort. The reason why they require extra effort 
is because if it gets depressed by normal pressure or normal movement then it could be a problem to the operator. So, some amount of extra work has to be done to press this emergency button. In terms of Manohar's case, how quickly can he respond? And this can be decided in terms of how quickly he can make his movements. There is a limitation to how quickly you can respond to something and how accurately will the movement be. We will look at that in further uh, time in this lecture, but for now the idea is to know how quickly the limitations of Manohar will allow him to make uh, his response. One aspect of human behavior that must be considered in nearly every application of person centered design is movement. Remember that the cognitive aspect plays in the mind. The stimulus is perceived, it is made meaning in terms of perception and then using higher cognitive processes a decision is made as to what action should be performed. The action is a motor response and this motor response is of importance. No matter how accurate you are in terms of the decisions that you have taken, the finality of this decision always depends upon how quickly and how accurately you can execute this motion. Even if the right decisions are made and the actions are not performed correctly, you would end up into error. Think of a situation, you go to an ATM and insert your card, you try to remember your pin. You may have trouble in remembering it, but by using some mnemonic devices or some form of uh, memory retrieval, you get the pin. What good is a pin if it could not be inputted into a keypad and through which the, uh, the card interface unlocks and you can perform your action. Some people out of speed press the wrong number on the keypad and because of that they are not able to input the correct pin and be, uh, because of that they can be timed out. So, execution of a response or motor movements are an integrated and essential part of human factor engineering or an essential part of designing interfaces and products. The operators have to move in order to operate controls. There are numerous limitations in our ability to move quickly and accurately in certain circumstances. Operators which operate on cranes or any other planes, they operate with controls. People who work in human factor engineering, they re realize that the design of the system requires an operator and a system, but the operator cannot interact with the system directly. He has to act through certain controls. These controls are interfaces which combine the input of the humans and the, in the input of the machines. It is an interface or it is that link which connects the humans and the machine. So, design of control is essential. Now, how quickly could humans execute will design will decide how quickly a control is pressed or how quickly the decision for pressing a control is executed. If the decision is executed in the right speed and with the right accuracy, you can get the desired result, but if there is inefficiency or inaccuracy in pressing a control, this could result in problems. Now, constraints on the human ability to move quickly and accurately as well as a theoretical understanding of how skills and coordinated movement is achieved. There are several constraints. 
constraints which decide how movement should be mapped. Constraints could be in terms of the perception or it come it can be in terms of the motor response itself. Constraints could all be also be in terms of how accurately a constraint uh, a control can be seen. So, a number of factors both environmental, internal and context can decide how quickly can people execute a response. A number of things to consider here. First, the ability to move rapidly depends upon initiating quick responses. How quickly can you initiate a response? You may be able to hear and understand a situation, but converting this into an actual response is another ball game. So, the quick with the quicker decision that you can press a button, the quicker you can initiate a response. Think about all those times when you are part of a game and you have the response in front of you. Those quiz shows where people can come up quickly with answers, but they forget or somehow half depress the button which allows them to give an answer. Having the answer is part of the game, but a more important part is also related to how quickly and how accurately you press the buzzer which allows you to res respond and report your answer. So, ability to move quickly depends upon reaction time. The other factor is called movement time which is completing fast movements. It is not only how quickly you can initiate an action, it also depends upon how quickly you can com uh, complete fast actions, how quickly can you move. The, some people have a little bit problem in motions of the limb and so this movement of the limb also adds up to executing responses. The more quickly you can move your limb, the more efficient your execution of the response would be. If, if you have seen accidents, you will realize that some people are very good in getting out of accidents. They can get out of accidents because they have a very flexible body and they can perform certain maneuvers and actions and can avert an accident. On the other hand, some people although are very good drivers, but they do not have this hand action movement and because of that, they land up into accidents. So, not only how quickly you can initiate a response, how quickly you can move your limb to execute and complete that motion also adds up to something called the accuracy and speed of movement. Not only the speed with which you can move adds up to motor skills, how accurately can you make a motion also is responsible for motor skills. Now, the ability to operate controls depends upon a number of factors. Since in human factor engineering, we are studying people who are interacting with systems, the only way to interact with the system is through a control and so a lot of work and focus has been given to the understanding of controls. So, the ability to operate controls through which humans can interact with systems depends upon a number of factors. The first factor is how quickly you can select a control. Normally speaking, when people or operators work with system, there are a number of controls. One factor which influences correct execution of response is how quickly you can identify the right control. If you identify the wrong control and work with it, there could be problems. So, understanding the right control is an important part and that is the subject matter of understanding the layout and the size of the control. Another factor which helps us in operation of controls is to avoid errors in control operation. If you have initiated an action of pressing a control, how quickly do you realize 
that this is an error and stop midway. And the third is what are controls? These are manual devices which are used to operate systems and technologies and examples of controls are buttons, switches, levers, knobs, pedals, keyboard, computer uh, mouse, joysticks and the like. Now we have seen that motion or human movement to execute a response depends upon two things. One reaction time, how quickly do people respond and the other is movement time, how quickly they can complete an action. We will now study these two factors one by one and try to understand what are the meaning of these terms. The first factor is called reaction time. What is reaction time? Reaction time is a time that people take to respond to certain stimuli and provide a response to it. The first labs in psychology which was started by William James investigated reaction time. William James was interested in finding out how quickly do people hear certain sounds and respond to it. So, he had balls which were dropped from a certain height on a plate and the job of the responder or the participant was to hear the ball hitting this plate. As quickly as the ball hit the plate, the job of the operator was to press a click button to execute a response which says that he has heard the ball hitting the uh, plate. What William James was interested in is finding out how quickly can people respond and that is what is reaction time. Reaction time is how quickly you can perceive a stimulus, make meaning out of it and come up with a response or react, react to a particular stimulus. So, reaction time is the time it takes to initiate a movement. A surprise event happens. How long does it take for you to notice and react? If you are familiar with watching the world wide web, you would be also familiar with the idea that sometimes on web pages you have contents which capture your attention. We have talked about this in the section on attention. These stimuluses or objects on the web have something called saliency in them and they capture your attention. By capturing your attention, they take away your focus from the content that you are focusing on to something which may be relevant or may not be relevant. Reaction time is how quickly you identify that your attention has moved to something which is more salient, something which is more moving or appealing and you execute a response to close this additional stimuli and get back to what you were doing. This quickness with which you either close or eliminate this stimulus and come back to your original st uh, stimulus or content that you were reading or watching is called reaction time. The example here that I have used is a car in front of you hits their brake suddenly. How quickly do you realize that you were in danger and move out of the path of the car? The car hits the brake and you will both hear it and see it. Sometimes you might be busy with something else, but the ear has something called omni omnidirectional properties. So, it will hear that loud sound of the brake. With this loud sound hitting your ears, how quickly do you move out of danger? This is reaction time. So, how should reaction time be measured? A good way to measure reaction time was proposed by Donders way back in the late 1800s and early 1900s and he proposed something called a subtraction method. Think about any cognitive act. Now, the cognitive act has three parts to it. One, a stimulus is perceived and you give a reaction. This reaction 
is actually a decision which has been made from the meaning of the stimulus. So, the perceived stimulus is interpreted first in the basic form and then complex meanings are extracted out of it. These complex meanings are compared to some sort of information available within the long term memory and based on that whether the stimulus which has been encoded requires a response or not you will decide the appropriate response in that situation. Just deciding the response is not the end of it. The response has also to be executed. Take the example that I described a moment ago. So, you are walking on the road and suddenly hear a large braking sound from a car. This event can be divided into three parts. The first part is you hearing the sound of the car brakes and the second part is how this sound of the car brakes are interpreted by the primary auditory cortex and the secondary auditory cortex and further uh, by the more complex processing areas of the brain. Based on that the sound of the brakes the complex area decides that this sound can be categorized into several previous experiences, but the one experience which matches closely to it is the sound of a brake from a car. Based on that your higher cognitive process gives two response. First it gives you the response that this could be the brake of a car and the second response that it gives to you is that quickly move your hands and legs or your body out of harm's way. As soon as this response is generated, some signals are sent to the affected muscles or to your hands and legs so that it quickly moves out of that particular road area to prevent accident or harm. So, this simple act of hearing the braking and moving out of the car's path is a complex process. The reaction time is how quickly do you move out of the car's path after hearing the brake. Now, this three sections that I have described will add to the reaction time and what Don does propose is that there are three types of reaction time. By subtracting the two primary reaction time from the third reaction time, we can get decision time. So, the first is the perception time which is how quickly do you hear the stimulus. Second would be the reaction time in terms of response selection and the third is the decision time which is the time you take to decide what action should be initiated. So, reaction time is a component comprised of three components. According to Donders, there are ways to measure these three reaction times and the first is the simple reaction time. Now, Donders says that simple reaction time is equivalent to detecting a stimulus for example, a light and to responding for example, press of a button as quickly as possible. Simple reaction time is seeing a stimulus and responding to it. And the example that I have used here is the average reaction time of humans being 200 millisecond. So, from Donders method, he found out that if a sound or a light is produced and people are given a button to push as soon as they realize that they have seen the sound or the light, the time it takes for them to press the button from the onset of the stimulus is 200 millisecond. So, pressing simple buttons in response to stimulus occurrences is called simple reaction time. The other kind of reaction time which Don does talk about is called the decision time. This time is the time people take to detect two stimuluses and make a response. Now, detect one of the two stimulus for example, green or red light and respond accordingly example, press button if green do nothing if red. 
So here there are two stimulus but only one response and the job of the operator is to decide which stimulus to respond to and this is called the decision time. It has been found that an average reaction time of people in such type of situations where two or more stimuluses are, are available but response is only one is around 300 millisecond. The subtraction method says that if we want to come up with decision time, we have to subtract 300 millisecond which is the decision time minus 200 milliseconds which is the simple reaction time. In the simple reaction time, there is one stimulus and one response but in the de decision time, you have two stimuluses. So, both the stimuluses will create an input and the job of the operator will not be only to press a button but also to decide. Now, if I want to measure how much time does the operator require to decide, I have to subtract simple reaction time from the decision time and which this is what we, I have done. So, 300 millisecond minus 200 millisecond which is simple RT gives 100 millisecond which is the time it took for to discriminate between the two stimuluses. Another kind of response time is called the response selection time. Now, assume that there are two stimuluses and two responses. Here, the subject not only have to decide which stimulus to respond to through which meaning, he also has to decide which button has to be pressed as a response to which stimulus. And so, this is called response selection time. And if I want to get response selection time, I have to minus response selection time, the uh, total of response selection time and from that I have to minus the decision time and the stimulus uh, simple reaction time. Now, the case that I have for you here is that detecting a one or two possible stimulus and perform one or two possible responses. So, I might have two lights red and green and the job of the operator would be to press the square button or the circular button, the square button for green light and the red uh, and the circular button for the red light. Seems like an easy job, but here not only the subject has to discriminate between the stimulus, the subject also has to understand which response should be executed for which light. And so, here not only subject has to decide between the stimuluses, but also decide what response to execute. And for that purpose, the reaction, the response selection time is actually the leftover from the decision and the simple reaction time. So, average example average reaction time is 450 millisecond. Now, subtract 400 millisecond, 50 millisecond response selection time from 300 millisecond which is the decision time and 150 millisecond which is the time it took to select between two responses and I will have the response time. So, in the example that I uh, talked about where there is a bulb which is lit and the subject has to press a button. If one bulb and one button is related, this is simple reaction time. But if there are two bulbs and the subject has to press a button for one bulb and not for the other bulb, this is called decision time. But assume a situation where there are two bulbs and there are two buttons and the subject not only has to distinguish which bulbs comes up and but also make responses in terms of specific key presses for each bulb, this is called simple reaction time. This is called response selection time and response selection time is the leftover from the addition of simple reaction time and decision time. So, if my reaction time for a situation where there are two responses and two uh, stimuluses, if the total time I take to complete this task is 450 millisecond, the uh, response selection time would be equivalent to the 450 millisecond minus the 300 millisecond which is uh, the decision time which is 150 millisecond and this is how reaction times can be measured. There are a number of factors which can affect reaction time. The primary factor that determines the simple reaction time is the neural transmission speed, but that is fixed. Reaction time is dependent on how quickly the neurons take the information from the central nervous system and pass it on to the effector muscles to make an action. But we know that the nerve conduction velocity is fixed at 25 meter per second. So, that factor cannot be one of the primary reasons for reaction time. So, what other factors are there? 
reaction time depends on the intensity of the stimulus. The more intense the stimulus is, the fast, faster the reaction time is. With stimuli near threshold, that is faint stimulus exhibiting longer reaction time than stimulus above threshold. A simple reason for this proof is that if the stimulus is not visible, it becomes really hard for you to concentrate and extract the stimulus from the noise. If there is a faint light in the presence of many lights which are brighter, it will take you time to identify this faint light and so the reaction time will be longer because you have to dedicate your focus on to this smaller uh, light or faint light within the context of brighter lights and that is why the reaction time would be uh, more higher. Now, once the stimulus is sufficiently visible though, little is gained by increasing the intensity. If the faint light becomes near to threshold or near to the brightness of other lights, then increasing the intensity of this light further is not going to help or increase the reaction time. An interesting finding regarding the number of possible stimuli and responses is that the total reaction time increases with the logarithmic of the number of choices known as the Hick-Hyman's law. What Hick-Hyman's law suggests is that the reaction time is directly proportional to how many choices that we have and the relation between th them is a logarithmic function. Starting with simple reaction time of, of about 100 millisec 80 millisecond, Hick and Heinemann separately found that with every doubling of the number of stimulus alternatives, total reaction time increased by a fixed amount of about 150 millisecond. Now, I have put here a study by Keel 1986 and if you see this study or if you get time to look at this study, you will find more interesting results. In very simple word, what Hick and Heinemann suggest is that the more number of alternatives that you increase or the more number of controls that you increase which subject has to operate on, the higher the reaction time would keep on increasing. And with every addition of a stimulus, the reaction time increases by a fixed amount of about 150 milliseconds. So, if there is one stimulus, the reaction time would be 180 millisecond. But if there is a second stimulus, the reaction time would go to something around 330 millisecond. Add the next stimulus and it increases by 100 millisecond. Uh, and this goes on till 3, 4 or 5 stimuluses because after that it becomes a problem of short term memory. So, with any, every any increase of a stimulus, the reaction time increases by 150 millisecond. Now, there is a logarithmic relation between the number of stimulus and the reaction time and what Hick and Hyman says is that the relation between the increase in number of stimulus and the reaction time is a logarithmic function and this is the logarithmic function as you see that in number of stimulus alternatives increase by 2, the time increases around 150 millisecond, increases by 4 and these are the timings that you see it is increasing till the point of time it becomes bit of a constant. So, we have talked about reaction time. Remember, we also talked about another part of making movement and that is called the movement time. Movement time is equivalent to how long it takes you to execute a movement through your limb or through any other body part. Now, movement time is the time it takes to complete a movement from start to finish, from the end of a reaction time to the time of movement stops. For example, pressing a control or operating a lever. Remember the example that I gave you in the beginning of this lecture where I talked about a hypothetical person called Manohar and he is operating the crane. So, movement time is the time it takes Manohar to grab the control and press the lever so that the, the arms of uh, this machine that he has aligns with the uh, either the deck or the ship or the shipyard. The primary factor that constrains the speed of reaching movement is the accuracy required for that movement. Now, one of the factors which decides how quickly can you perform an action depends upon how accurately you want to do that action. The more accurately you want to complete an action, the more time it will take. Think about the cell phone interface. 
on the display of the cell phone there are several buttons and if you want to accurately press an icon you have to be slow now there are if you traditionally look at a traditional display there are a number of icons and if you have selected maybe let's say the google pay option if you very quickly press your finger chances are that some other button would get pressed or the google play button would not get pressed and it would get dislodged from where they are if you want to accurately press the google button for payment you will have to very accurately and slowly press this button and then you'll achieve the function fast actions are not accurate and accurate actions are not fast this is the rule small targets requiring more accurate movements are more difficult the smaller a target is the more slower your response has to be because smaller targets take more attention now as task difficulty increases the likelihood of making an error increases unless we move slowly and carefully enough to ensure that we are on the target now if you have ever seen a goldsmith working goldsmith work with very tiny pieces of gold and for them to carve something out of that gold the movements have to be very slow in a position if you have ever visited a uh, iron smith his actions are very fast because the tools that he makes is bigger in size and so his actions can be quicker because accuracy is not the deal here in terms of the goldsmith accuracy is important because the amount of material that he has to make or the complications of the material that he has to make is more fine and small and so more accuracy is required the rule again is if you want to be accurate you have to be slow but if you if you are fast then you will not be able to perform accurate movements the speed accuracy trade off is just as its name suggests which is moving quickly and moving accurately tend to be inversely related therefore as your speed increases you normally decreases accuracy this is true because the quicker you try to do something the more less accurate your actions become simply understanding how this works would help you in designing your movements and performing your movements accuracy has to deal with focus and when you are providing more focus to a job it has to be slow because attention cannot work very fast so if you are putting focus on something your actions have to be slow to achieve that action but if you want to do a job more automatically with lesser attention then accuracy may suffer think about driving when you are driving automatically less focus is there so you may achieve the basic accuracy of driving but when, uh, finer movements or finer actions may not be uh, achieved when you are not focusing on the driving you could drive but if uh, a small bottle comes in the road you may not notice it and move over it uh, but if you are paying full accuracy to driving you will be able to notice the bottle and avert or not crush it so accuracy and uh, speed are inversely proportional to each other if one increases the other decreases this phenomena has been studied so much that the mathematical expression of speed and accuracy trade off have become one of the most established principles in the study of human movement and that is called fitts law so what fitt did what he proposed a logarithmic rule to map human movements in terms of speed and accuracy in 1954 psychologist paul fitts designed a task that required participants to point back and forth between two rectangular targets as quickly as possible while still being accurate so this is the target and so what the job was to quickly move between this and this the keyword here is move quickly and move accurately so you have to go from here to here 
and here to here and move between these targets. What was the result of his study? Fitz was able to determine two factors that determine the difficulty of this task. Fitz found out that in achieving the task or achieving the accuracy and speed, two factors contribute. One of this is the width of the target and the other is the total amplitude or the distance that the movement has to be done. So, this distance which is the movement that the person has to do and this distance which is the width of the target are responsible for the subjects making more accurate and faster uh, responses. The response here is moving from this target to this target as quickly as possible. So, the width and the distance are two important parts here. Now, Fitz discovered that movement time or the time it takes for people to move from one target to the other was longest for smaller targets and longest distances. If the distance between two targets is long and the targets are small, it will take you more movement time to between move between them because distance d and target with w were inversely related to each other. They could be expressed as a ratio which is d by w which represents the difficulty of the task. So, the difficulty of a task which requires movement is expressed in terms of a ratio d by w where d is the movement or the distance that has to be moved and w is the width of the target. The difficulty of doing a task is related to this. So, difficulty of a task of performing a task is inversely proportional to the width of the stimulus and directly proportional to the distance that has to be covered to move the task or to achieve the task. In case of Manohar, if you uh, look at how quickly he, he can perform an action which is stopping the uh, crane depends upon how small the emergency button is. The bigger the emergency button is, the higher the chances that he will be able to press it. Also, how where is his hand in relation to the button, the emergency button? If his hand is still on the lever which was lowering the arm of the lift of the crane which was carrying the load and if this distance between the lever and his hand and the emergency was long or far apart, then it will take more time for Manohar to press this button. But if the lever, the stop lever is nearby the lever which lowers the load, then the actions could be performed much quickly and the crane could be stopped. So, the task that Fitz used was participants held a stylus and tapped back and forth between the targets as quickly as possible while still being accurate. This is Fitz's law which says that movement time or the time it takes people to move between two targets is expressed in terms of A and B and log to the base 2 ID which is the item difficulty or the difficulty of doing a job. So, MT follows a strong log linear relationship with ID or item difficulty. Now, one could further assume that the participants ideally aimed at the center of the target. The target width is important, but generally it is believed that operators will aim at the center of a target because that is where he is concentrating for doing the motion. He will not move from side to side. So, in this target, it is if people have to tap on these targets, it is believed that they will tap on this center and not here and here. So, the actual room for error at the end of the movement was actually one half of the target width. Since we are focusing on the center, it uh, the width gets divided by half. That is the distance between the target center and the edge, which is W by 2. So, now the ratio can be re refined as ID or index of difficulty can be, de can be defined in terms of the distance between the target divided by the width and divided by twice or half and this becomes 2D by W or index of difficulty of doing a task or movement time can be described in terms of ID equals to 2 times the distance between the target divided by the width of the target. 
which could be expressed more simply as 2d by w and this ratio is called the index of difficulty and this law is called the fitz law now when fit plotted the empty data as a function of log to base 2 of i index of difficulty he found that there was a strong linear relationship between the two described by the linear equation mt equals to a plus bd a is the constant and b is that factor which id has to be or index of uh, difficulty has to be multiplied to get this equation this is the slope and this is the coefficient of id this relationship is known as fitz law in this case a is the slope of this curve and b is the factor above which so since you can see that this line is not starting from zero so there is a distance which is here and this distance from zero that this line is starting is actually the value b a is the slope of the curve or what is the bend at which this slope is what is the angle of the slope from this uh, vertical horizontal line researchers can predict mt by simply knowing the distance of the required movement and the width of the target so movement time can simply be predicted by looking at the distance and the movement of uh, that somebody has to do and how big a target is so how should we make movements more accurate minimizing spatial errors that is uh, can you hit the target you are aiming for most accurate movements are executed relatively slowly when we can see the target in our hand fewer errors are uh, made so one factor which helps in movement accuracy is if we can see our hand or that limb which is making the target closed loop controls and open loop controls are two processes which are uh, uh, designed to define the accuracy of how quickly we can hit a target what is a closed loop con control in a closed loop control people actually see the limb making the action and when they see the limb making an action then uh, a feedback is provided to the area of uh, the brain or the cognitive system which is executing this movement so this feedback can then help in making corrections to the limb so that the target can be achieved or the exact button can be pressed in oppose opposition to this open loop systems are those systems where no feedback is provided uh, to the brain or the cognitive process which is making an action so accuracy of a movement can be defined through a closed loop system and a open loop system whereas closed loop system is a feedback control where feedback of each movement that the hand is moving for executing a response is provided to the cognitive system which is making the action and here corrections of movement and uh, can be made and errors can be minimized open loop systems are those where no feedback is provided and the quality of the stimulus or the perceptibility of the stimulus and other context related factors decide how accurately you can perform a movement or a movement action closed loop controls mean that movements are guided by a feedback loop that continuously monitors the state of the movement and generates modification to trajectory as errors are detected so your actions are monitored and your trajectory is also monitored through a feedback loop and your actions can be controlled so that errors can be lowered down the information evaluated during the feedback loop is the position of the hand related to the desired target example when reaching to pick up a cup i notice that my hand is aiming too low so i adjust the movement to aim higher this is done generally subconsciously now according to the closed loop theories feedback information is most important during the later stages of movement when the hand is nearing the target so this correction doesn't come up very quickly in the initial stages of making the motion it comes up at a later stage when finer movements are done or finer actions are taking place there is a point of no return beyond which feedback based corrections cannot be executed at this point any remaining errors in the trajectory will remain uncorrected having said that corrections can be made there is a place or a point where if your movement has reached from there 
no amount of feedback will make any correction and the action has to be executed. But beyond that place of no return or the edge, any correction which is required can be made provided on the feedback of the visual system or, or the proprioceptive, proprioceptive system uh, which provides continuous uh, uh, information regarding the position of your hand in relation to the target and this can help you make corrections. But as I discussed there is a point beyond which no amount of feedback is going to help. Now the theoretical perspective places emphasis on the role of visual information about the hand and the target during the movement. Evidences in favor of this view come from observation that movements made in dark or in other such situations where the hand is not visible are less accurate than when the hand can be seen. Now the what is the evidence which suggests that this kind of feedback, the sight feedback of where your hand is in relation to the target uh, can help you in making final movements. If you off the light and your hand cannot be seen, in those cases this kind of corrections cannot be made and you will be as inaccurate as the closed loop uh, person or you can be highly inaccurate, no corrections can be made. So, people are highly inaccurate in comparison to those cases in which they can see their hand making the motion in relation to the target. Now, in situation that requires zero to perform accurate movements, the relevant controls should be located where the hands can remain visible. This is especially relevant when the eyes may be occupied with other tasks and may not be able to look away from those tasks long enough to control the movement towards out of the way controls. Further, the presence of occluding surfaces that may block the view of the hand during the operation of certain controls should be avoided. So, avoiding occluding surfaces, maintaining your eyes on uh, the target and your hand, all these is going to help you in making accurate movement in closed loop. Uh, actions. Now, there is another kind of loop which expresses how motions are controlled and this is called the open loop control. The movement theory suggests that fast movements are guided by an open loop control in which motor commands are issued to relevant limb. So, the limb gets an information from the cognitive process making this motion and they give this information to the relevant limb in terms of making the motion. So, if you have to press a button, some command is given, but then this cognitive system does not get any feedback in terms of what the action the hand is doing. In closed loop circuits or closed loop control theories, the motion of the hand in relation to the target is provided as a feedback to those cognitive processes which is controlling the hand. But in open loop system, this kind of information is not available and the effects of these commands are then executed quickly without feedback correction. An example here is a batter in baseball quickly sinks to hit a 100 milli miles per hour fast ball. There is no time to process feedback. The batter was either accurate to hit the ball or was inaccurate if he missed. So, if you are hitting a ball which is coming very fast to you, the action that you do at the time of hitting the ball is the only action that you can do to make the ball cross the boundary. You cannot correct the path of the ball once it has been hit by the bat. So, that is an open loop system and the path that the ball will take is decided by the amount of force that you apply through the bat when the ball hits the bat. Now, the motor system contains some inherent noise or variability and in open loop movements such variability can lead to errors. Errors in motion is because the system which is making these decisions it contains noise. Further, this noise is amplified when movement speed increases, making it more difficult to point to small targets accounting for the speed accuracy trade-off. Now, speed accuracy trade-off as explained by open loop system is because the noise that the system which is producing the motion, this kind of inherent noises leads to the uh, speed accuracy trade-off or speed weighing opposite to the accuracy. Also, the smaller a target is, the, uh, the harder it becomes to find it and make the motion and these kind of uh, external factors like the size of the target and other context related factors in addition with inherent noises within the system which is making the motion uh, come, uh, added together is responsible for the uh, speed accuracy trade off. 
Now another source of inaccuracy in open loop movements results from errors in perception. So how you perceive a stimulus and what meaning that you generate from a stimulus is also responsible for inaccuracies in open loop systems. According to the principle of open loop control, one must visually perceive the target location and then using either vision or proprioception or both perceive the location of one hand. So what open loop systems then tell is errors in making the motion result from perception errors. Now this perception errors could be visual perception that is uh, sight perception as you see the hand actually making the motion in relation to the target or it could be proprioceptive motion which is the motion of the body balance. You see the body uh, balance and you feel the body's balance and based on its normal balance and the balance when it is making the motion, a comparison between that will give you whether in inaccuracy has resulted or an inaccurate uh, action has resulted. Now the information about the initial position of the hand related to the target is then used to plan a movement trajectory that would transport the hand to the perceived target location. So here your body's position as well as the visual uh, stimulus as well as your hand these two combines together to give you information as to how the action should be planned. If you can process these two informations together and plan the action then there will be lesser error in making motions or movements and you can achieve the motion. In terms of the story that I had described in a closed loop system, Manohar would get constant feedback from his internal system in terms of where his hand is and where the levers are and where is the button that he has to press. These will combine together to give him information and make corrections as in stop the lever which is lowering the load midway and with his other hand press the button hard which stops the uh, or which is the emergency button and this way the lift will stop in motion and the uh, accident can be avoided. In terms of the open loop control, Manohar has to get information from his proprioceptive system which is the vestibular system and other th uh, third information systems and the visual systems and devise his motion in such a way that one hand quickly presses the button and the other hand quickly jams the or holds the lever in such a position that the um, emergency lever is pressed harder and first and it stops the uh, crane in, in a position so that uh, the load is not lowered or it is uh, still hanging above ground and the disaster can be uh, averted, people in the ground could be saved and he can have a nice uh, day for himself in a win-win situation. So today's lecture we looked at reaction times and movement times and we looked at how motion or movement uh, helps us in uh, designing controls and systems so that human operators can interact with systems and get the best performance out of it. In the next lecture, we will look at the design of controls and how the information about controls can help us in deciding what kind of motions should be made and how motions should be uh, executed and designed and put in the interfaces so that uh, the operator has a good time interacting with systems and achieving efficiency. Thank you and Namaskar from the MOOC studio. Thank you.